In this video, we're going to be going over what the project for this tutorial is and, uh, and you know what it is, why we're building it and uh, how it works. Uh, so for um, for the project, we're going to be building our own ECS uh, well component system. So ECS stands for Entity Component System here. In game development, entities are pretty much everything that you see on the screen. Sometimes things that you can't even see on the screen. Uh, so for example, the player is an entity. The, uh, the enemies are entities as well. Um, so if we, you know, excuse my, my terrible uh, stick dr uh, drawing, but we have our like main player, uh, that's a single entity. Um, perhaps the player has a sword that is itself potentially an entity attached to the player. We have like a little, you know, Goomba er enemy. Um, well, whatever that is, that's an entity as well. Perhaps even like the sun is an entity. And uh, sometimes we can even have these hidden areas where if the player moves through them, it kicks off like a uh, uh, some kind of like event that happens, maybe like a voiceover um, or a, a cutscene. Those can be entities as well. Pretty much everything inside of a game can be an entity. Um, so an entity component system is really about breaking down entities into individual components. So if we take a look at our player here, um, well, our player has a location. Our player has a velocity. Um, our player has maybe a, um, an acceleration. Uh, and like a width. And a height. All of these little snippets of data uh, together form what that player is. So in traditional OOP programming, we might uh, create a class like for player and a class for enemy. Um, and then we might have inheritance where we have like a super class that like is for, you know, uh, moving and moving entity um, or just entity itself. And then then we can sort of like get more and more the specific as we are going down the uh, the hierarchy. However, entity component systems sort of move away from the idea of uh, object oriented code and a little bit more towards uh, data oriented or functional or sort of a combination of, of both. So what does that look like uh, as far as like we're concerned? Well, it kind of looks like we're creating a flat database inside of memory. So Let's imagine that for each of these these things here, uh, in fact, let's just go ahead and take you and we'll move you over here. Let's imagine for each of these, we just have a vector of data. So then for each of you, Gonna copy you down. So now we're gonna have a vector for locations, a vector for velocities, a vector for accelerations, widths, and heights. Uh, and then we're gonna have uh, the cells. So essentially, we're creating this sort of like Excel or Google, you know, Drive style of um, database in memory. So our player. is going to be the first slot in this. And what that really means for us is it's a it's a vertical slice across all of these vectors. So in location, we're uh, potentially going to have maybe like a struct um, or like a tuple or an array or, or something that has like an X and a Y value. So that could be like 10.0 
uh, 12.0. And that just goes in right here. And for velocity, well, velocities are very similar. So that might look exactly the same. Acceleration, same thing as that. Um, width is usually just like a single number. So let's do that as like 50.0. And height would be maybe something like 100.0. And so that gives us uh, a good sort of feeling of like, what is a player? Well, it's just all of these down here. Well, okay, we have enemies too. So if we move, we now have our, this is just like the first enemy, an example of what we might find. Uh, you are, you have a location also. You have a velocity. You have an acceleration. You also have a width. You also have a height. Um, it's pretty much the same thing as a player. The only difference is it has an AI driving what it does as opposed to the player, which has you know command inputs from a controller, let's say. But let's take a look at the sun here. So if we have a sun, well, you're gonna have a location, but the sun just sort of stays in one spot. So it doesn't have a velocity. It doesn't have an acceleration, uh, but it does have a width and it does have a height for drawing purposes. So suddenly now we don't have something in, in every little, you know, every little piece here. But what this really means is if I go to query and I say, give me everything that has a location of velocity and acceleration. And I just want these things right here. Well, that's gonna give me all the players and all the enemies. And specifically, just the components of the players and enemies that I care about, and then I can do the math for this. Now, why is this really important for, for game development? Well, it's because in most game development, we're working in a very tight time uh, schedule here. Uh, almost all games nowadays are targeting a minimum of 60 frames per second and that gives us what like 16.66 uh, milliseconds per frame to do all the math and draw things to the screen all in that tiny 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 time period now computers are very very good but we're also working with devices like cell phones uh and maybe we're even going to get to like watches and other things that are not very powerful and we still need to target that 60 frames per second so what we can do is we can do everything possible to speed ourselves up. And at this point, we're now talking about some of the slowest operations, which is reading from memory. And um, uh, it used to be that memory was the fastest thing on, in our computer. And like, we didn't have to worry about it as long as it was in memory and not on the, the hard disk drive, we were good. That's no longer the case. Memory has not increased in speed the same way that CPUs have. So therefore, we need to make sure that we are, um, when we grab from memory, loading up into the CPU cache, and then do all the operations on on that, we're grabbing as much stuff from, uh, from memory as possible that we care about. So if uh, the way that memory works, if we have everything next to each other, which in vectors, they are next to each other, I want to grab you. Let's just say like, I want you. And it's going to end up just grabbing the next several things, just because most often that's what we want. And there's enough room in a cache for several different vectors of things. So if I want all the locations and all the velocities and all the accelerations, those are all going to be loaded up into cache at the same time. Then, I'm going to do my operation on, come on, let me grab you. Uh, you and you and you, and then loop through and do the next one. And I don't have to go back to memory for that. Uh, this one's skipped, and so I get the next one and the next one and the next one. And they're all just right there with me in, in memory. And so it's super fast operations and therefore I don't have any so-called cache misses. 
This gives me more time to do interesting things like play sounds or draw more complicated things to the screen or, you know, do just have even more entities on, you know, in the game and uh, do even more calculations. So that's the reason why ECS systems exist. Now, why are we going to build an ECS system? Because we're not necessarily going to be building a game with this. We're just going to be using this as a interesting project to make sure that we learn Rust and learn a little bit more advanced Rust than maybe like the ultra beginning uh, Rust that we've learned with the book. Well, the reason for that is uh, building something like this, like an uh, in-memory database, is um, is a little bit more complicated than building like maybe let's say a to-do project and because of this complication it's going to force us to delve into maybe a little bit a little bit part of rust that we're not used to so for example we're going to need interior mutability that means we're going to need to get um we're going to need to like store things and pass things around by reference by immutable reference but still somehow be able to mutate it inside of that. That, uh, that doesn't seem like Rust is going to allow us to do that, but there are ways to do that. So we're gonna cover that in this course and it's gonna be part of the project. Uh, we're also gonna be doing bit shifting, uh, working with binary. And uh, that's something that, well, until I did some game dev, I never had to do with, with the web development that I was doing previously. So therefore, that's also something that's going to be really interesting to learn and just something that's nice to have in your toolkit. Yes, it's not something required very often, but when it is, it's nice to have that available. So that's what our project is going to be. Uh, in our next video, we're going to go over the architecture and what the project is going to look like file-wise. So I'll see you there and uh, bye.